hosting an open call for editors. Um, you can look on the website for, at compositionality-journal.org, where there's currently a kind of a draft web page up. Don't worry. This, uh, we've heard from many people that there are many things that we maybe should change about the design of this website, and we are very much happy to listen to all of your feedback and opinions and change the website for the better. I have a background for you if you want it. <laughs> Thank you, Fabrizio. We will not be using that background. Um, so, yes. What I thought I would do is we go back to the, we just run through some quick acknowledgments and I'll pass it over to Nina, who will go over kind of the, um, what we've set up to run through the feedback and have Oh, yes, we have a. Yes. Interesting items. For example, there is a manifesto that Brendan put together. And is meant to convey the spirit. Um, basically, the compositionality is meant to serve a community, and it's built around the community. And so, we will, the idea is also that we really would like to keep it flexible, and we would like it to evolve together with the community. And then there is a thread about the editorial policies, which is, I guess, what is it? Uh, 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 no, it's no, second one from the bottom. Right, so here it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts about it uh, because we are still there, not fixed. Um, so we would really like to have a, an editorial policy that uh, reflects the desires of the community. So, because our goal uh, with this journal is really to somehow have the best journal possible, and, uh, and maybe if I can skip just to the bottom, and it's uh, thanks to Ilya Scan, so he encouraged us to try to aim for the best thing possible, the best channel possible. And um, yes, and also we are we stole lots of advice or also, let's say, good um, from the journal Quantum. Josh, I was going to ask, what was happening to you when that photo was <laughs> taken? This is a draft web page. Many things will no, be No, 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 the pictures. <laughs> The pictures will stay. <laughs> we want to make science fun and crazy. <laughs> and so we have, um, so the structure compositionality uh, will be registered as a, um, as a charity in the UK. And so there is a fixed structure. Um, the steering board is basically the face of the journal. And so yes, we have two members of the steering board, John and Bob, and then Catherine will join us later this week. And uh, yes, and then we have the editorial board. And uh, while well, you can apply to be an editor, where is the application here? So there is an open call for editors. And uh, well, I guess I don't need to say more about this, right? <laughs> uh, the deadline is May thirty first. May thirty first, yes. And then the executive board is actually who is putting in all the work. Bit <laughs> 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 crazy because yes. You know, if you manage logistics, funding, administration, and publicity, you end up like this. In the end. And uh, here is the constitution. And, uh, and I think that's it, right? Yeah, yes. that's pretty much it. Um, once again, all the links for all this can be found at the website compositionality org, including the link to the open call for editors, as well as the Reddit discussion. And we would once again love to have your feedback. In fact, we love it so much that we are having a discussion section immediately after uh, Bob and Alex's uh, right immediately after the coffee break um, here in the main hall where we'd like to hear some of your feedback about how we can make this journal really the best vehicle for serving the community uh, that's represented here um, but, but most importantly the paper will the journal will start accepting papers over the summer please submit papers because it is papers that make a journal Good papers, good papers. I'd like to thank them because there may never be a public moment to do this again. Because you have something for you. So thank all of you. Um, on top of that, uh, so there's three quick announcements, uh, which I'll go through really quickly. Um, so one thing, besides the journal, there's actually another publishing initiative that um, Bob and I are working on with some editors at the Cambridge University Press. Um, 
we're starting a book series uh, for applied category theory. The idea here is that people can submit kind of uh, short monographs, 8 to 120 pages at a kind of graduate level, and we'll essentially we'll publish them as their own small individual little little books. Um, it's kind of meant to serve as a pedagogical stopgap between things like Brendan and David's recent um, sort of, uh, seven sketches and sort of the more cutting edge uh, publications just directly on the archive. So if you're interested in publishing your own book on some feature of applied category theories, like applied category theory for engineering or applied category theory for dynamical systems, uh, please do feel free to contact myself and Bob. David? Peer uh, it will be peer reviewed, yes. Uh, or there will be a panel of editors who, are, who will be sort of looking at it and making sure the right things go in, yes. Which publisher were you talking about? Cambridge University Press, yes. Um, Third, uh, just a little bit more about the discussion section. So we'll have our first sort of real discussion section um, in the afternoon, immediately after this talk. Uh, just once again, just to emphasize one small thing. I know there's a, lots of people wanting to get lots of different things out of the discussion. And we just want to encourage, uh, at the beginning of your discussion, to pick one person uh, to actually take notes or summaries, and then to have take those summaries and post
as one of the most amazing things. That mass starts by teaching people how to count, and counting is by no means anything which, which, which like a little baby learns at any stage very early on. I mean, they, they, they almost, they, this is the stuff they actually learn before anything, or know before anything. So the categories are there before the counting and all that. And, but then, of course, you go to school and they, they force you to, to, to do all the stupid symbols, and one of the most horrible things. They do with kids, I've got a little kid now, is that they, they start they teach them how to write letters, write like the letters three or the letters two. What the fuck is that? It's nothing to do with two or three. So, and they, they, they get all these obscure coding which means nothing and they, they, they fuck up all our brain. That's why we so fucked up. Now now think uh, so because this is actually the basic structure. Now things actually get better if, if you then dig a bit. And actually, the mathematician Rene Tom was somebody who was very interested in education and he had very deep ideas about that. And then he said, the first structural thing that I create that we identify as mass that, 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 that kids grasp is topology. I'm not talking about this mobile, sophisticated topology, I'm talking about very basic like wires and, and stuff like that, topology. So the first thing kids understand is topological, so that's basically string like that. They can understand string diagram before they understand counting. It, it's, it's, so one should actually acknowledge that these structures we are now talking about here are actually really very, very, very basic things which kids understand at a very early age. And, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's really the sort of causal reasoning and then and it's sort of the first thing which goes beyond like pure causal reasoning, the sort of topological structures which they can identify. And a lot of people People have done experiments about that, and I mean, I mean, that is sort of a, that's sort of this weird, very obscure YouTube video of, uh, I think, Oppenheimer talking about his interactions with Piaget, and then Piaget was telling Oppenheimer too that the point is the most basic thing that children understand about these things. Okay, there you go. So, okay, I mean, this is philosophy. This is philosophy, so the claim here is all these things are much more primitive than all the bullshit math you all have to learn at school. Uh, so, so we're going to put this to the test, actually. So, so the question is, how long can you do diagram science? <laughs> At what age can we really start doing this stuff? And so one thing we will be doing very soon is basically an experiment where we're going to set up a bunch of kids learning diagram quantum mechanics against a bunch of um, Oxford twats. <laughs> to usual quantum mechanics, and they get the same tutorial and the same questions, just different language, and, and I mean, the kid is going to win, of course. <laughs> then you actually prove the point that that's actually much more primitive maths. Anyway, so this, 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 this about how the category is fundamentally coming out of the idea that we reason causally in the most primitive way. <coughs> uh, okay, now, now let me talk about relativistic causality and a little bit more to connect up more with what people thought we're talking about. Morning. I'm just going to talk about one equation which is already on Bart's life, and uh, which we call causality. Uh, the sort of story for anybody here who hasn't bought this yet. <laughs> I avoid me in the pub, I tell you, until you buy it. Uh, well, right, so that, that's kind of the story I'm following. And, and basically, what the key there is that, for example, a diagram. It's just a bunch of boxes with input and output. Where everybody knows. Uh, everybody knows the machine. It's called diagram. These are systems. These are processes. So that's that's how this works. Uh, and then a theory, or what we call a process theory, is just an interpretation of diagrams. So you assign to each wire a system. You assign to each box a process in your theory or in reality. And then you have to interpret what it means to wire things together. That's sort of the complicated bit of the theory. So that's really where your, your operations are. What does wiring mean? A wiring can be actual physical wires, like in electronics, or mathematicians, they want to be composed like this or that, and that's where your symbolic category theory comes in, because that's how mathematical things have been traditionally composed in these two things. Or, or they can basically just be causal influences, these wires. I mean, you don't have to think of them mathematically or as actual wires, they could just be causal influences. 
Uh, we got some special things like specialist uh, process called state. We've seen a lot of states this morning. In Barstow. In the same pictures. Effect is the dual of state. So that's kind of made with the year. But you got something and then you got nothing. So state, you got nothing and then you got something. Means, it actually means you got a wire coming out so you can do something with it. Here, there was something you could do something with and then it's not there anymore. So you can think of this as a test. You test something and in many cases if you test it, you basically destroy the thing, right? But then you know something about it. And a number is something without an input and nothing. Now I'm saying this because, uh, I mean, which was, I think, I don't think, I mean, I Here, the word direct notation this morning, but not this context, like, like, this is really common. This, this sort of bit of string diagrams is actually what's already present in the right notation in quantum physics because you take this triangle and you chop off this corner and then you turn it around. You get sort of your cat. If you do this, you get your graph, and if you do this, you get your bracket. They are sort of. So, in a way, string diagrams are two dimensional direct notation. So, they are. So, they are. Uh, Wait, we're going to look at one very special effect which we call discarding. You saw this in Bart Stark, this little symbol, right? They used this as a or marginalization or something, but I mean, I think of this as discarding. Uh, and if you got a theory of reality, you always got discarding in your theory. Although people don't account for it, it's always there. Because have you ever, I mean, I mean, many people here have talked in theories about something. Do you consider what's going on on Mars? When you build your theory, do you? No. So you discard what's going on in Mars. Yeah, if you, if you, you make a theory about what's on the table here, you discard what's not on the table. So you always discard part of the universe to actually discard, to, to talk about the part of the universe you want to talk to. So discarding is just always present in any scientific theory. So it should be a, a basic ingredient of any theory you build. People don't do it, but it's there all the time. So, so we will always assume that our process categories are categories of this notion of discarding. Uh, for example, I mean, you can think of it marginalization and probability theory, but it's sort of more basic than that. Now, uh, why it's even more basic is because it actually is key to defining what causality means. And causality, we saw this equation in Bart Stark, that's this. So what is causality? Causality means that if something is going on in Mars, something is going on in Mars, and you don't have access to whatever comes out, then you can totally ignore what's going on in Mars. Pretty obvious, right? Pretty obvious. It looks pretty good. Now, if what's going on in Mars is they're building a huge, huge super laser cannon, and then they're, they're gonna shoot the Earth into tatters, then I mean, then then. The art is not the scar. The art is a big bullet. And then this is not true. Yeah, but if, if, if the art is discarded, then you can as well discard. And I mean, so I, I mean, I wrote it down. So this is the principle of causality. When the output of a process is discarded, the process itself may also be discarded. And but like I already indicated, this is actually necessary to even do science. You can't do science without that. If you can't discard part of the universe, I mean, there's nothing you can say. We always have to account for anything which... And in a way, this is sort of a change. I mean, I see this as very fundamental. I see this as some sort of progression, modernization of uh, Poincaré's scientific hypothesis that science has to be done in isolation from the rest of the world. So a laboratory is basically a big box which isolates your experiment from the rest of the world, because otherwise you can't exclude. I mean, say, no, we have to be a bit more liberal. Things actually may be interacting with the rest of the world, but as long as this is true, we're okay. So it's sort of a weakening, I would say, of the principle of doing science. And that's, that's what causality means, and that's, that's basically what this equation is telling you. Uh, uh, basically, this, I mean, I, I kind of stole this from some physicists who use this in a much more complicated way, in an axiomatization of quantum mechanics. It sort of showed up as that they rebuilt Hilbert space from some primitive axioms, and this was one of them. Uh, but it, it was a bit of, Now everybody sees, what does this mean categorically? It's, the, it's, it's like category theory 101. It basically means that if all your processes obey this, that the tensor unit is terminal. That's it. It's very simple. But we sometimes I call this terminality. 
Because that's what it is, tensor unit is terminal. So it's a very, very simple thing, but it's a very fundamental principle. Uh, may I, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, that, I think that's where the tension with probability theory is, because if you impose it, you kill all your dualities in your category. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> because you, you can't have also the, term, the tensor unit initial, that is a bit, with both terminal and initial, you're in a problem. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Uh, so now, so what, why is this called causality? I mean, so, uh, sorry, sorry, why is that a problem if your tensor unit is terminal initial? You don't have state. Oh, I see, from there. Right? We've got yeah. totally trivial theory. Yeah. You don't have any state. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's okay, maybe that's okay. Yeah, that's what I have in mind. Yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. 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 State must be, yeah, you have to come up with something else. You have to come up with something else then. But I mean, in this sort of thinking, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, uh, right. So, so why, why is this? So, th this obviously is a very nice fundamental principle, which you clearly, I think everybody would agree, you need to even do science. Now, why would this be called causality? And I'm here thinking really to make things simple as causality as in relativity, like, like sp spatially separated things can't influence each other. Like if they're far away, they can't directly influence each other because you've got the light cones and you've got a limit to the speed of light. What does this have to do with that? I mean, in particular, it's an equation about a single system. Well, what I'm talking about, like distant systems can't affect each other or if they're far apart, sounds like something about multiple systems. It's sort of funny that this would actually do something there for you, but it does. So what I'm going to prove is that from this equation, that's all I'm going to do today, you can actually derive that you can't signal. So that, that, that Einstein is happy in his grave and all that, and you can't signal from one part to another. And I'm going to prove this simply from this equation. So what does no signaling mean? OK, I'm going to formalize what no signaling This is no signaling from Alice to Bob. So what does it mean that Alice can't Bob, uh, signal to Bob? So what would signaling mean? Signaling means that. Alice sticks some, so this is Alice's side here, that's Alice's, so here we got this box, this is Alice's side, that's Bob's side, so signaling means that Alice would stick something in here and Bob can, can deduce it from its input output pair, you could first think he gets it out of his output, but actually he could also maybe get a correlation between input and output which tells him what Alice was trying to tell him. So that's actually more general if you allow for that too. So let's try to be as general as possible here in possibilities of communicating. Uh, so, okay, so that's signaling that Alice can stick something in and Bob read this from his input out to pair. Yeah? This is an input, this is an output. Now, what does no signaling mean? Well, I mean, Bob definitely doesn't have access to Alice's output because otherwise it would be very easy. Yeah? So, no signaling means that given that Bob has no access to Alice's output, that basically, from Bob's perspective, Alice's input is discarded. And of course, totally disconnected to whatever is <coughs> going on at Bob's end. Uh, everybody agrees this is sort of you no know, signal. If you look at how people formulate these, in, in, formulate these things with probability theory, that's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. So, but this, this you can write down just with boxes in a very intuitive way. So I'm going to prove this. I'm going to prove this from the previous equation. That's what I'm going to do. So now, uh, now basically what I have, I mean, I'm going to, I was talking relativity and I have to say one way or another that these two are far apart. So they're spatially different uh, separate locations. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume some causal structure. Let me, so the causal structure I'm assuming I can write it down. You got Alice, you got Bob there, they're far apart. Maybe something can be sent to them from the past and they can send stuff in the future. So that's the causal structure I'm thinking about. And I want to show that using boxes, which can be quantum processes, which can be anything, and which obey this equation, there is no way. There's no way that Alice can send anything to Bob. You know, you could think if there is some quantum stuff here in the past, may, especially because the properties of quantum mechanics and the non-locality and all that, which you may have heard about, that there may be some way from Alice's signal to Bob anyway. 
So we're going to prove, no, 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 this is not possible. So here is the causal structure. So we got <coughs> Alex's hand, a Bob's hand. We got something in the past and something in the future. We got an input. I mean, I just, the input is actually local here and the output. I just uh, dragged it out to make it sort of match, to make it sort of match this box as a whole. Eh? Because this box you now have to think of, uh, you, this box you now have to think of as this thing as a whole. You have to think of this as a, this thing as a whole, right? And we're going to show that effectively, we're going to show that we get this from this. That's what we're going to show. We get this from this for this. Right? Okay, let's start. So, so this is an instance of this causality equation, right? If you've got two outputs and you discard them both, the means of discarding your two inputs, right? The same thing, the same thing. You prove this, you prove this. You directly prove this. And if you've got no outputs on the left, well, it doesn't matter because discarding nothing means, means doing nothing, right? So then we got this. Yeah, so they all follow from this first equation. Uh, all right, okay, so that's good because this already goes. This already goes. This already goes. Gone. Fine. Yeah? Uh, okay, now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the left hand side of this which means we have to stick in that thingy there. We go to the left hand side of this, we're going to stick in that thingy there. Boom. And what happens now? Boom. Okay. We are where we want to be. The input is this car, and this is totally disconnected from that. So we just proved there was no possibility for Alice to signal to Bob from this causality. And I see confused faces. Yeah? yeah? So is this the, can you put the equation you're proving back up? Yeah. Um, so on the left hand side you have, and I'm going to uh, use the classic notation, on the left hand side you have a map from x tensor y to z, let's say, yeah. x and y, bottom, dead, top. So it seems like, are you saying that in any, say, symmetric model category, every map from x tensor y, x tensor y to z can be expressed as map from X to... The no, 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 no. So I'm using... I'm using... I'm, what, what, what am I sticking in? I'm sticking in this. Yeah. I'm using this. And I'm using the fact that there is an internal structure to that big box. You're saying any map that factorizes this way. Yeah. So, so, far apart, so, uh, so this, this, this articulates that E is Alice far apart from Bob. They may have some contact in the future. They yeah, may. Okay. So these are like light cones. These are like light cones. You have to think of this as light cones. Right, okay. So if that is of that form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah that, that's it. Well, yeah, of course, of course. Well, otherwise, you can't prove anything yeah. like that. But it's sort of basically what's being shown is that this causal structure of stuff happening in space time is respected. There's no way that sneakily you can have direct communication here and there. Thanks to whatever resource you got in the past and whatever resource you got in the future. I mean, it's it's just a, a fact. This, like for example, quantum mechanics can be quantum. The, this can be quantum process, and then you're showing that quantum theory respects relativity. That's what you're showing. That's what you're showing. You can't signal faster than light using quantum mechanics or something like that. That's what this is showing. Uh, so so yeah. So so I just showed this. So you prove no signaling from this principle. And conversely, this is actually also equivalent to the other one, you know? You basically what you do is you take these two systems to be trivial, right? And now I get a box, I discard this card. So they're actually equivalent. I mean, it's like, a, you, you need this number to be unique, that's all that, right. whatever. That's, a, that's sort of where I stopped being a mathematician. Okay. Anyway, nobody gets the joke. Uh, you can actually, you, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you can actually uh, strengthen this result into what I would say that causality, this principle, is exactly what a causal structure is supposed to do. Because when people talk about causal structures in physics, they talk about some partial order <coughs> right down here as a graph. And then they say, yeah, well, the partial order means, for example, that B can't signal to C and that A can't, uh, that D can't signal to C and stuff like that. But they don't say it mathematically. They don't say it mathematically. 
Now, you can say this mathematically by decorating this causal structure. Yes. Same from here to there, nothing should flow through. And in a way, you can then prove that saying this stuff is equivalent to this causality principle, and it's sort of a generalization of this no signaling thing, which I just proved. It's just a generalization thereof. But in a way, it's more, more elegant, because it's sort of, in full generality, it tells you that relativistic causality really boils down to this equation. And the last thing I'm going to say is just to make it a little bit silly, uh, that if you take the time reverse of a causal theory, then you get eternal noise. And that's very provocative to physicists, because a lot of physicists think that physics is time symmetric or something. <coughs> All theories of physics are time symmetric. So, okay, here, this is a causal theory. Every theory we know is causal. Everything obeys this. Like, you put this upside down, boom, I just did, just did. That's time reverse of a causal theory. What does it say? I mean, you got noise. In the beginning, there was noise. And then you do whatever you want to it, and you got noise. Everything is noise. So that's the time reverse of physics. Noise. Right? Yeah, there you go. You've been taught that well, physics is time symmetric, right? Well, sort of. You got a few. Yeah. <laughs> so the heat death of the universe, it started out as the first time of the heat. I mean, there must be a start. There must be a start. So, so the start, and then the only thing you can start with is this, because there's no other state. So, so or maybe it just never started. <laughs> and then it's not all noise. Well, what is it then? <laughs> okay, that was it. I don't think I've got anything else to say. Yeah. using the blackboard, yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit more light would be good. Gently. Yes. Okay, so the first thing I should say is I haven't really prepared a talk. So if, if, uh, if nobody asks any questions about the few things I have prepared to say, then, then we'll be done in five, five minutes or something. So, so please, please uh, interrupt me, ask questions, that, that sort of thing. Um, so so what's, the, what's the point of this causality? I guess that's that's a good place to start. Or, or actually, what what do we mean when we say causality? Um, that was the theme of the day, and that's that's what we organized today around. Um, and actually, it means lots of different things to lots of different people. Right, so, so there's, I'll say at least there's there's at least at least three kinds of causality. Ah, yeah, that's a bit, a bit better. Um, so, so the first one that, that, that Bob was talking about kind of implicitly the whole time, and I'll say it a bit more explicitly, uh, it has to do with um, causal structure in the sense that a physicist would use it. Causal structure. Uh, and I might even say something like causal structure of space-time. Uh, and that's that's this idea that, that you know, we we live in this um, manifold, probably four dimensional, maybe more, uh, and we think of uh, some of those dimensions as space, and one of those <coughs> dimensions as time. Uh, so these things can can of course vary; they're relative. Um, but the the more important thing than what these what these axes are called is the is the induced causal structure from a from a space time. I have some event that happens at a certain point in space-time, and I can think about like if that 
if that didn't happen and, and, and something else would have happened, what, what other events in space-time could that have an influence on? Uh, and that's where you get this uh, idea of light cones, right? So I can, I can think of the, the, the forward light cone is, is all the other events I could, I could reach from that point without exceeding the speed of light, right? So there's only so far in space I can go in a certain amount of time. Um, that means I have some sort of a timeline path connecting those things, right? Um, and you think about this thing very geometrically with Lorentzian manifolds and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but the, the interesting structure, uh, at least the interesting structure for me and many people to look at, is, is uh, really just what relationships exist here. So which events in space-time could in principle have an influence on others. Uh, and that's just fundamentally some kind of order structure. Right? So if that's, if that's A, say this is B, maybe there's some other event, um, some other event, say C, here. Then I can see that it's possible that A is in the past of, of B and C, but, but B and C are space-like separated, so they couldn't have any influence on each other. Right? So something I can deduce just by geometrically where these things appear is that some kind of causal structure like this, right? that A acts as a common cause of B and C. Right? So this is, when, when Bob was talking about things like non-signaling, this was all kind of what was going on behind the scenes. Right? We, have, we have Alice and Bob here, and maybe, maybe someone else prepared an entangled quantum state for them to have sometime in the past, but they can't talk to each other anymore. So they're so they're non-signaling. Um, so that's this kind of idea of causality coming from physics. Uh, and and it really talks about a kind of potential of things to, to influence each other. Um, we also have a kind of flavor of causality coming from uh, statistical. Uh, say causal inference. Causal inference. Um, and this this starts with uh, say you just have some joint distribution. Uh, so I like to think about states. So I have some some state um, in say. Uh, the category of matrices with positive numbers, if, if, if you like, or, or, or this category stock, whose states are just probability distributions. And this is just some probability distribution over, uh, say, um, five random variables. Um, and I want to try to figure out to, to what extent some of, these, some of these random variables serve as uh, causes of, of another one, right? So if one of them is, is whether someone was administered a medication, then, then maybe another one is whether the person got better. Right? So, so here, I, I, um, the relevant structure here to study is, is, uh, looks rather, rather like that. Um, um, but now, rather than talking about points in space-time, this is, well, just some kind of directed graph, but we'll probably think of it as something like a Bayesian network. Um, now, there's, there's some confusion here in that, there's the, that Bayesian networks can be seen just purely as a tool for working with probability. So, so, so this doesn't need to actually say anything about causation. It doesn't need to say that that's a cause of that. Um, so maybe to clarify this, I could say it's something like a causal Bayesian network or some generalization thereof, which is really just saying I'm putting this interpretation that actually this thing really does cause that, that thing. Right? So, so no formal difference, just a difference interpretation. Um, I had a, had a third... I had a third thing, yeah. There's um, also in, in computation. There's a few few notions of causality. Um, the one that I've been thinking about a bit lately is one that the uh, 
that the co-algebra community likes to think of, which is, which is the notion of causality for a, for a thing called a stream transducer. So this is some kind of function or machine or something like that that takes in a possibly infinite stream and produces another one. Um, so this is some function from streams to streams uh, such that if I look at the i th thing on the output, then that depends on uh, only the first i things of the of the input. Um, including i, yeah. I think, I think I think that's that's true. Uh, so, so this is a kind of these these domains and codomains are separate. So it's not a sort of feedback thing. It's just it's just saying that in fact I only need to look at finitely much of the input. In fact, only i much of the input to get the i. Input. So it kind of always produces the next thing for me. I never have to wait, you know, unboundedly long. In fact, this is a very strong way of saying that. There's even weaker ways of saying that. Uh, and that's a that's called a causal function on streams. Um, and you see, all of these, all of these have uh, somewhat of a similar flavor, uh, in that they always have this feeling of things are are only determined, or they're totally determined by things that happen in their past somehow. So, so, so I can think about. I can think about, for instance, this, this output being determined by only things that happened in the past. I don't have to sort of reach into the future to see what happened, or I don't have to, in this case, I don't have to look at what happened on Mars. I just look at what's in my causal past, and, and uh, I guess a similar thing here. I, that's, that's what we really try to capture by this, by this causality equation. Right. This, this is really meant to say that, that uh, if I look at a single event or a process or something like that, uh, then the only influence it has is, is on its future. Right. So if I, if I get rid of its future, then, it's, then, then it kind of goes away. Yeah, do you want to say something? Yeah, so there has to be, so, so, there has to be four types of causality because Aristotle says so, so it must be right. <laughs> um, so the fourth type is you have a, an event which is controlled by an agent, and by an agent I mean the thing that has agency. Mm -hmm. And a particular, uh, and the agent is acting in order to, so the agent is reasoning about the future and acting in a way that brings about some future state that the, that the agent would like. In that sense, the future state causes the... Oh, like I, the building the house kind of yeah. stuff, like I want to, I want to have a... My, 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 my wanting to have a house at some point in the future is what caused me to buy the wood or something like yeah. that. So you, d you don't have to worry about that in physical science because you have it easy. In, uh, in social science, we have to worry about that. All right, yeah. Um, I think that's, I think that's uh, interesting to look at those things as well. I mean, here, here we're often actually thinking about agents as existing at each of these points. Because some, somehow if these were just... If this was all just purely living in this world of general relativity where everything is kind of deterministically determined by my boundary conditions anyway, then it doesn't actually really make sense to say whether that has some causal influence on that because there's no way for me to intervene at this point. There's no way for something besides A to actually happen so that I can see something different here. So actually we always talk about something kind of operational or some agents are living, living on these points. Uh, I wonder if there really is a notion of time implicit in the statistical inference picture. So, uh, I mean, we hear on the internet all the time, right, correlation is not causation. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I think in, in these sorts of uh, systems, if you've just gotten A and a B and you know they're correlated, often you can't identify the direction of the arrow. So it's not clear that these are as obviously time-linked as the other two. Um, at, at, at this level of granularity, I would, I would agree with that. So, so if, I'm, if I'm just purely looking at this, at a, at a kind of decomposition of a, of a system as a Bayesian network, 
Uh, this this has nothing whatsoever to do with causality. I mean, the, you could. I mean, it, it puts some constraints on what kinds of distributions would appear here, uh, but sometimes they're very weak. I mean, so for so for instance, I can I can get I can get any distribution I like on on two variables with this kind of structure or with this this kind of structure. Right, so so this is kind of what I was trying to say uh, about a causal Bayesian network is not just a Bayesian network. Um, and maybe I'll say say a bit more about this in a moment. But you always start not just with some statistics, but you have to put a little bit more. So you have to put some assumptions about where those statistics came from, uh, and then you can start to do causal inference. Um, and in fact, with with this situation where I just have two variables, it's still impossible. Um, because I can't, I can't tell the difference in these two situations and and this situation um, simply because I don't have enough data around. Uh, but I can tell the difference in something like this situation and this situation, like say. So, so, so if as soon as I have enough kind of context around here, um, as long as I assume that my data came came to me from some kind of underlying causal mechanism, I can start to try to see what that mechanism is, even by just looking at that observational data, and that's somehow the kind of miracle of causal inference because it, it seems like you shouldn't be able to do that, but you you actually can. Um, Right, so so I think. Uh, hmm. Well, I'm on. I'm on. This is. Into a. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, I, I think. I, I think. Um, I think the eternal noise statement is somewhat morally vacuous, but, but, uh... Hey. <laughs> like... <laughs> Basically, at least in the, in the eternal noise universe, you could die in interesting ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but in this one, like, this is kind of like the universe we know where everybody is eating. But then how do you do tests, you know? How do you throw properties? Yeah, so... Doing that with effects, stuff like... Yeah, so, so yeah, that's I think different. that's different because then you learn something, so you still have a wire coming out about the things you learn. So here you got the wire coming in. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I guess the the dual the dual of that statement should be something like, I'm I'm never allowed to just just prepare a state and I have I have that state. Uh, but I would be allowed to do this, which is which is something like. I, I have a I have a demon giving me a random bit which I have no control over, uh, and then I'm allowed to prepare a different state depending on what what bit that is, as long as I do it in a suitably in a way that suitably depends on this randomness <laughs> such that that sort of up, that upside down equation is, is satisfying. Um, so I think the morality of that equation is if something is gone, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. It's not. It's gone, so there's nothing yeah, more yeah. to it. Yeah. But I, I think there's, so there's sort of a, there's sort of a difference. The way we actually work with this stuff um, is we have we have some some category uh, which has which has everything in it. Um, so so in this physical case, uh, I think of this category as a 
Cool. <laughs> Where did that what come from? What do you do with that random bit? <laughs> 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 how, did that, how did that, where did it come from? from? <laughs> <laughs> it must have come from the past, yeah. So here's, here's, here's my category where I haven't said anything about causality at all, right? Um, which, which for probability distributions or stochastic processes, it means I haven't said anything about things being normalized at all. Um, I don't care if my probabilities are 3 or 0.1 or whatever. But then we can think about a subcategory of causal processes which, which live in there. So, so here's my subcategory of causal processes. Uh, and for, for this particular category, uh, causal processes are stochastic matrices. So here I have any matrix of causal numbers. Uh, and here I have uh, matrices whose columns sum to 1. So in particular, my states here are probability distributions. Um, but I only have one effect, uh, which is just the marginalized effect. So it's, it's just sum over everything. Um, now I would claim that this is, this is the, the category that models things that actually happen, uh, or at least a, a suitable coarse graining of things that actually happen, where we put some probabilities here. Uh, but this is a useful mathematical logical category where we can have things like non-trivial effects, like what is the effect that corresponds to true or false. Um, so, um, and I think this is this is somehow analogous to, to, to this idea in mathematics that, that maybe this is something that exists in the, in the universe. Like, like maybe I'm really a hardcore constructivist. I think that rational numbers are the only thing that actually exists in the universe. And there's no such thing as these weird complex numbers. Uh, but they're still quite quite handy place to do computation. Right? So that's, that's sort of how I see this universe of all non-causal stuff. Um, Yeah. If you want to, if you want to discover causal structure, you shouldn't. Yeah. You should. You should have a model which allows for things that are not that causally yeah. ordered so, from the, from so the that, start. That, so. That's a good point. Uh, also, relationship with this model. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. It's kind of like you want to sort of you want to maybe take a take a big messy bunch of data in the world, or maybe I have some complicated signal flow graph or something like that, and I want to try to discover. Something about its causality. Yeah. Right? I think the point is that uh, you should be able to generalize uh, until the point where you get a compositional model, where you can just plug things together without worrying about whether mm -hmm. you are 
the causal output that there are inputs or outputs or not. And then, of course, you have to keep the hard job in the value yeah. inputs and outputs. But this could be a bit of a mm. Is it then enough to have the larger world as a free extension of the causal world? Yeah. So I'm not sure it would be. So uh, it depends by the theory. For instance, in Sigma for graph, this is the case. So you could prove that, for instance, if you have linear subspaces, you can always find uh, uh, a causal uh, structure that witnesses the subspace. So in that case, it's sort of the extension. But I wouldn't be sure that is always the case. But I would say, as long as you know what characterizes the causal problem, mm -hmm. you are fine. I mean, in quantum mechanics, like the dif difference between left and right is actually quite subtle because you could do, you could start doing science and you observe something. Say, oh yeah, this thing can happen, but can happen is not causal. So, so ultimately, mm -hmm. what you need to do is mathematically build a whole spectrum of all the things which possibly can happen. I mean, it's not easy to actually figure these out what they are because you mm -hmm. have to. Yeah all of them to happen in a, in, a, in a repeated experiment. And once you got all of them together, you actually get something causal. So, so it's really a distinction between what may happen and what will happen with certainty. Mm -hmm. And what will happen with certainty is that one out of the number of alternatives is going to happen. What may happen is each of the alternatives. Each of the alternatives violates relativity. If you just start building a theory about that, you have to take the things as a whole and consider everything that possibly can happen. And then you obey a lot of the theory. Yeah, it's, something, it's quite subtle. Something without even... Something non-causal which happens all the time without even going to quantum uh, is selection bias. So if I, if I want to do some statistical study uh, and I want to see if a, if a typical person satisfies X, Y, and Z, uh, doing that in a causal way is actually quite difficult because I'll go to Massachusetts and I'll do my study there and actually what I've already done is I've ignored all the people who don't live in Massachusetts, right? So somehow I've made a, I've made a, 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 a I've introduced some selection bias into how I'm doing my experiment. And, one of the, and that's one of the two things, so latent variables and, and selection bias are the, are the two things which make this, at least the inference part of, of, of this causal thing quite, quite difficult because you don't, it's kind of like uh, somebody has done some post-selection kind of against your will uh, and you still have to look at your data and, and, and account for that somehow. Um, but actually, so, so there, was, there was one more thing that I actually wanted to say uh, and, then, and then we can go, go completely free form here, if you will. Um, And that's, there's, there's two kinds of problems, and now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this, this causal inference rule. Uh, not necessarily statistical, because I, I, I would think about statistical causal inference is what happens in this category or your favorite category statistics. But of course, you can do this in lots of categories if you have a bit of structure in. Um, and there's two kinds of problems that are closely related to each other and easy to get a bit, uh, a bit mixed up. Right, so the so in any case, we start with a kind of say we start with a black box like this, which has some inputs and some outputs, um, and maybe I know at least that, that this input and output pair go together, this input and output go together, uh, this go together, and this go together. So now maybe these are four different events which happen at different points in space and in time. Uh, and I'm trying to discover some causal relationships between these things, right? So, so you could say I've got, I've got this process like this, and and I'm trying to figure out how, what its causal structure looks like, right? So, so maybe if it has a has a structure that looks like, that looks like this, right? So I can see this as a diagram, as asking, well, does does this thing decompose? in this kind of way. But you saw a picture that looked quite a lot like this in Bob's talk. Um, 
So you see these inputs and outputs are kind of acting like local controls. Like here's, here's something that I could interact with in the past and then it's sort of going forward and influencing these things in the future, which in turn is influencing those things. Um, now there's, there's two kinds of things I might want to pull out of a black box like this. Uh, one of them is actually just the shape of this diagram. So, so, so not caring what's in these boxes. So, so say letting them be totally parametric in what's actually in the boxes. What is this diagram shaped like? Right, because that, that really tells me where my potential causal flows are. Right, this, once I know this shape, then I know that the, that the only thing in the common path of, of B and C is actually this A. Right, I don't have to know anything about what's in this, what's in this diagram. Right, so, so, the, so the shape of the diagram uh, is, is, is what in this statistical field is called causal discovery. Right, so. Um, and in fact, you could see this, rather than discovering that these are the real causal links, what I'm really doing is ruling out other causal structures which are inconsistent with, with what I observed about this box from the outside. Right, so, so here I take some, some independences I observe about the box. Right, so, so say I, if I trace this thing out and that trace sort of falls through like that. So this was like these non-signaling conditions. If I roll up all these independences, maybe I can start to discover what this thing's shaped like, and that's a, that's a causal discovery problem. Um, but once I have the shape, I could ask, well, how strong, say, is that is that edge versus versus that edge, right? So I could try to measure how much this thing causally, how much say A has a causal influence on on B, because this. This box, actually, if I now peer inside of this box Y, it could be that I'm just ignoring what came in there and doing, doing something totally, totally different, right? So discovering what's in the boxes, so, so, so um, finding or quantifying Morphisms themselves um, this is called causal inference um, and a crucial thing is that both of these start from some kind of assumption so so in the causal discovery case, my assumption is that this thing does have some factorization. Um, so there is some underlying causal mechanism which produced, say, these statistics or this quantum channel or something like that. And furthermore, all of these independences that I see from the outside came from the causal structure. Um, so, so this... This, there's an assumption which goes in here, which is called faithfulness, uh, which physicists sometimes call no fine tuning. Which says something like there's no conspiracy of the universe where things just happen to be independent even though they had the ability to talk to each other. So there's enough, there's enough noise in the universe that I'm never going to see such an independence appear unless there was in fact no causal influence between those things. They couldn't be related by the causal structure. So, so that, that is a crucial assumption for doing that. Uh, faithfulness, it, it also has a, has a name in Bayesian networks as well that you, Fabio knows this name, right? What's faithfulness called? Where all your independences? It's called IMAPS, or yeah, I think it's IMAPS. Um, but it's 
it's essentially that that um, if I see an independence or a condition, conditional independence, then there's an explanation coming from the DAG, which now we think of it as a causal structure, an explanation coming from the DAG for that independence. It's not that I've just tuned my parameters such that things happen to be independent of each other. So, so this would be an example of a fine tuning, right? I've, this is a very special box which has decided to ignore that uh, and then just put out some other state. If I look at another box which is epsilon close to that, I won't have such a such a separation. This causal discovery and, and causal influence of the basic fundamentally for structural and parameter mm, Probably, yeah. Um, so I guess they they wouldn't put the they wouldn't necessarily put a causal interpretation to a to a directed edge, right? They would no, just yeah. But yeah, it sounds. I mean, I I couldn't say definitely yes because I don't know and it's being videotaped. But but it sounds very <laughs> it sounds very similar to to, to that. Um. And then the assumption that goes into this into this problem is actually already that you have a particular shape, right? So, so somehow you can you can see this, which is really what I want to do, right? Does I want to I want to somehow measure how much smoking affects my chances of getting cancer, right? That's that's the kind of goal. Uh, but first, I should build some kind of model, or at least assume some kind of model, uh, and then I can try to, to calculate the parameters inside of that. In that model. Um, but now, so, so once you have this kind of idea where, where these things are really just about, about first decomposing as a, as a string diagram, maybe with some extra gadgets. So, so in particular, if I have copier gadgets, um, then as you saw this morning, I can do Bayesian networks in this kind of string diagram picture. Um, then you can start to play games like, okay, this is all of this classical stuff lives in this mat R plus category, or maybe some infinite dimensional analog of mat R plus. Uh, what if I change the category? So what if I go to a quantum category or a category of computation or a category of, say, biological systems or something like that? Can I can I push those tr those principles over there once I get it in this in this language? And that's 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 kind of the the program. Um, and yeah, I guess that's. Are all of these uh, categories coming from some like free hypergraph category? Um, like, is how you're sort of imposing these string diagrams on these different categories, or do they have different sort of string diagram structures? Um, so yeah, this is actually we we thought a lot about this last week with. Uh, there's, there's Sophie and Dimitri and Joe and uh, Pablo are, are all here, I think. Um, we, we thought about uh, this kind of distinction, well, this distinction between thinking in this level of, of what is, well, when am I talking about, say, probabilities and when am I talking about diagrams? Uh, and, it, and you can really see it this, this way, where when I'm talking about diagrams, I have some kind of free free category here, um, which that's supposed to be a script G. Uh, I draw them quite funny. Uh, but th this category is supposed to represent this kind of abstract causal structure, which could just be a directed graph or a hypergraph or some other kind of gadget. Uh, and you could think of this kind of like as the, as the syntax of, of uh, independence. Of independence. Or if you wanted to be really dramatic, you could say the syntax of causality or something like that. Um, and then, you, then we can play with, with where our semantics should go, but the, but the natural choice is, again, to take this map of plus, uh, and then we get classical probabilities. Um, and then we say, well, well, what does it mean to have a probability distribution uh, which respects the independences given by this graph? And it's just having a monoidal functor like this. So it's really having a model in the kind of functorial semantics kind of sense of, of that independence. Here's the kind of semantics of independence. Uh, 
Um, and and I should say before before Jamie points it out again, uh, Brendan figured out some of this stuff in his uh, in his master's thesis, um, which we only discovered I think on Thursday. Oh, we thought we had this great idea, but but then you should always read Brendan's master's thesis before you work too long on anything. Clearly, otherwise, it's all in the publishing. Yeah, said, no, it's not. It's not uh, it's, come on, it's super cool. You should definitely publish it. Um. Oh gosh, I lost my uh, lost my train of thought. Alex, yep. So, uh, if we had such a functory, that would certainly give us the answer as to what's in the boxes. But that's actually a lot more information than we're generally looking for. Yes, we're only looking for the value of that functor on some particular. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is in particular so, the one, and and also, I mean, we're not necessarily identifying the category G. Presumably, that's already given to us by. <clears throat> Or whatever we think of as independence or, or causality, what we're really trying to identify is a single arrow in that guy, right? Um, so, so it could it could be the case that we have G completely, um, and there are interesting situations where you have where you have that even though you only have partial knowledge, which is which is I give you a full causal model, but I say that there's some latent variables there that I don't have access to. So the, the classic one is the smoking causes cancer thing, and then, and then my latent variable is whether there's some genetic common cause of smoking and cancer. And I say I don't have access to that, but I can still try to find, and in fact, you're right, I, in that case, I'm not looking for this whole functor F, I'm actually just looking for certain morphisms in its, in its image. So in particular, I'm looking for, for the, uh, for the, causal path, which, is, which looks like some kind of sub-diagram of that thing, going from smoking to cancer. Um, and then if you've, if you've read Pearl, then this, this will correspond to the something like probability of smoking given do, no, wrong, probability of cancer given do smoking, right? So it's, it's these, it's being able to predict these, these hypothetical interventions. Like if I'd run a hypothetical random trial and I told half the people to smoke and half the people not to smoke, what would, have, what would my conditional distribution have been like? Um, and yeah, you see, you see fragments of this, this functor rather than the whole, the whole thing. Um, yeah. uh, am, I, am I the speaker and the chair? In this situation, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I guess by by asking me that question, you have now officially made yourself the chair. So do I have to quit now, uh, or am I allowed to quit now? I could put it this way, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's fine.